Well, season two of uh, Da Vinci's Demons. Uh, we hear it's going global. What can you tell us about the upcoming season? Bigger, better, longer. <laughs> it is longer. It's two episodes. Two episodes. Um, you start. Uh, yeah, well, it's we're basically um, expanding the show to uh, taking a journey for almost all the characters, both uh, geographically and emotionally. So uh, all the characters are going to be thrown together in... Combinations. Yeah, different combinations you would expect, different dynamics, people that you um, haven't necessarily seen working together, you have to work together, and not just in Italy. But whatever we get, it's not just restricted to Florence and Rome, we'll be spending a lot of time in Naples, a lot of time in South America, Genoa, uh, we're not supposed to say, but don't. <laughs> another place, <laughs> another, another, another country not South America or... Um, or Italy, <laughs> not part of Europe. Which is kind of fun. <laughs> so maybe Asia? <laughs> uh, it, maybe the gateway to Asia. Ah, uh, Middle East. Uh, but Asia, Asia is on our, um, on our. I mean, I mean, I. It's funny. I I, I read recently about that document. Um, that early document from Lost that leaked on the web where it was like, it will not be a serialized show and we will solve every mystery. And we kind of did something similar on this show when we were getting it going where we said, we're, don't worry, it's all going to be based in Florence. And I, I, my intention was that it was kind of a road show. From, it was a quest show. Right. So my intention was always that we were going to be going all over the world. And um, um, so we had a similar document which I just lied about everything. <laughs> <laughs> but now stars is okay. Tom, is there um, any pressure in um, portraying one of the greatest minds who's ever lived in the history of the world? Uh, does that ever weigh on you? I mean, when you put it like that. Yeah, there's, <laughs> yes, I mean, it's a strange double-edged sword because there's two versions of Glenmore. There's a version that we, that in the research I did about how he behaved in his 20s and what he was like, he's is a version that isn't really known and there is the version that everyone thinks and the expectations everyone has mm -hmm. and so you try and do justice to the version of him that the research showed and the, the very so I read some just the other week I read a really interesting letter he wrote to um, a duke in a, in, a, in a separate town outside of France that was the most arrogant um, almost like a borderline unpleasant letter right. I'd ever read right. and but the thing is, everyone has this man in mind who is far wiser and thoughtful and philosophical. And that is the man we're heading to. It's just going to take some time to get there. So it's, it's holding, holding your water. That's the pressure. That's what I feel. It's, it's holding back on where he's going to be um, in favour of the more sort of cocky version. It can be a hard decision. But what also, I think, and maybe you said this while I was grabbing something to blow my nose, but... Um, <laughs> I think that our general conception of him is this is sort of Merlin-like, mm. you know, bearded figure, and and that's just really it. I mean, he may have been like that at the end of his life, but if you read the accounts of his younger life, he was quite funny. I mean, he, by our standards, they're not particularly funny, but he published a book of jokes. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm not kidding, and he, he liked to do pranks and things like that, and he a vegetarian. He was an odd guy. Right. And I, I just read a thing that, that isn't in the show, but it should be, season three, that he used to inflate balloons yeah. in the corner of rooms um, just as a part of an experiment so no one could get out. So they'd be going, what is this? And then they realized it was being They were bladders. Thing, so he would pig's bladders. Yeah, yeah. He, would, he would literally inflate these pig's bladders so that they would get like to the size of 15 feet in diameter. Yeah. <laughs> Although we're, we're it's not the version of laying other people have in their heads. <laughs> but also that he, we were in Florence um, last year when we were premiering the show and we were doing this historical tour and um, they said at one point, which I loved, and this is this is this is the sitcom version of the show, that 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 Leonardo da Vinci and Botticelli had a restaurant on the Ponte Vecchio briefly yeah. that they ran and it wasn't successful because there were more concerned with like the presentation of the food than they were with it's the two broke girls version of it. <laughs> yeah <laughs> but that but that was but that was true and I just love that yeah. do, you, do you see um, for Tom do you see any of the we know it's an actual person that lived in you know renaissance do you see any of that 
differentiate stuff from your research coming into your own life and anything you put from your life into that? Oh, well, it's, I mean, it's, it's, as I said on the panel yesterday, it's very difficult to, um, to connect with the greatest mind in human history in a way that will ever do justice to that side of it. But I always believe that he... He didn't see his intellect as something that was all-consuming. It was, a, it was, a, it was a, a necessary side dish to the rest of it. Um, and uh, so it's really the more human moments and how he connects to the people around him, the relationships he had. That was the stuff that I could bring from my life into his. Right. Um, that's a striving for perfection. The, uh, the, the occasional self-loathing. <laughs> the never believing you've done well enough. And, right. and always trying to... Um, or, not, or I've never been able to concentrate on one thing at a time and leap from subject to subject. That stuff is, is universal, and um, that's the stuff I tried to bring to him. And then the uh, stuff I found out about him that came into my own life. For example, uh, something that I have to stop doing because it's something that now becomes very natural is I read a lot that he had, was somewhere on the uh, autism spectrum. A lot of people mm. speculated that his, a part of his mind may have been opened. Uh, so I uh, have um, uh, 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 autistic relatives, and I want to spend a bit of time with them and, and see what kind of things they have. One of them has a finger twitch, mm. very slight, when he's working something out. And then I watched a documentary Was since... Was that where that came from? Yeah, and I watched a documentary since it about someone, uh, uh, another autistic uh, young man, who, uh, whenever he was working something out, would do it with an imaginary abacus in the air. Um, and that was originally just mathematical problems, and then it became everything. And I just thought that's a very interesting thing. He did it like this, which would have got in the way of every, every <laughs> shot. But that I find, I've done it in the show, and now every once in a while when I'm working something out, I feel a finger twitch. <laughs> Sometimes I had to tell you in the first season to calm it. I called it the finger twiddling. Here. <laughs> calm it down. Mm -hmm. <laughs> David, you're known for writing very dark gothic material a lot of the time, and this show obviously has dark moments, but also has a lot of lightness to it. Was that a conscious decision on your part to, to kind of branch out from that, or is it just how, where the source material took you? Um, I mean, both. I, I, um, I'm, I'm told, although now it's going to sound really stupid in this interview, I, I, I'm told by people around me that I can be quite funny, and, uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> and, uh, but it was fun to write, um, stuff that had some lightness and had some humor in it and, and I mean things get very grim and portentous in Gotham City and Metropolis and, um, certainly with Blade he's a bowl of laughs uh, <laughs> uh, but um, yeah it's not, I mean Hollywood likes to pigeonhole you so in the feature world it's like you know write this grim dark <coughs> pretty hero thing and, and it was an opportunity I'd never done anything historical before so it's an opportunity to branch out okay. So when we talked to you last year, um, obviously the show hadn't come out yet, but so what kind of fan reaction have you been getting? Uh, pretty, across the board, amazing. Yeah. I mean, I'm not bullshitting. You. No, I know. That was, that was the biggest surprise, actually, is that the people who stuck with the, the, who stuck with the show to the end loved it. I mean, I think it's the same with all the premium cable shows generally. It takes a few episodes to get there, and once you're there, you're the best of it, and that seems to be... You know, just the nicest stuff said. Yeah, also I think people at the beginning were wrestling with the, I had always called it a historical fantasy, and so some critics took us to task for you know, taking choices that weren't historically accurate, whereas I had said from the beginning, this is what we're doing. Yeah, that's what we're doing. But now and It doesn't matter how many times you say it. I know. <laughs> no. But now that we've done that, everybody's fine with it, and now they're saying, oh, well, well what other characters like Dracula can, can you <laughs> meet and, and whatnot? So we've gotten over that hump. And people, you know, it's found its audience, and it's, and it's built, and it did quite well for stars, and now we're talking about season three, so it's cool. Was it like stars basically did that before, right? With Spartacus, that kind of like they did this historical sort of fiction. It was like historical fiction and or yeah. like a historical like embellishing things. So I mean, it's it seems like stars is like do it big. in comic books all the time, or, or even in novels and things like that. It's it's just that I think it's relatively new for uh, television to do something like that. So with that Sorry. last question. Um, so with that, uh, is there any character you'd like to add to the show that like you couldn't, but it would be funny to have? I don't know. There's anyone you couldn't. <laughs> <laughs> the, the parameters are so wide. Um, um, 
I mean, we had he, he was only in a walk on the first season, but Tor Gamano is the leader of the Spanish Inquisition, and this season we're adding. Um, there are a couple others that I can't mention that are kind of surprises near the end of the season, historical figures, but. Um, one that's quite fun is Amerigo Vespucci, who America is named after. Mm -hmm. And he joins the cast in episode two. Episode two, yeah. And, and, and what was fun, we were reading up about him, is you know, he's one of these famous explorers that is up there with Columbus. But you read about him, they describe him as this kind of shameless promoter, this sort of Samuel Lick character who you know, maybe wasn't that great an explorer, but just named a lot of shit after himself. <laughs> and that's kind of our take on him in, in the show. Oh, God. 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 Oh